Recently, I've seen vindictiveness, spite. I watched arrogant self-righteousness combined with a demonic grin in what we across the Atlantic call a sleek it person. That's somebody with a devious, sly, cunning, shrewd demeanor. I confess it shook me and tempted me to profound cynicism. But maybe even more dangerously, it made me think there is darkness even darker than the darkness that's in me. Be that as it may, true or false, I'm not sure. But it also reminded me of the host of people who jump right out of Isaiah 32. 1 through 8. I've told God many a time when he and I were alone that if he thought as I did, he'd have absolutely nothing to do with me. And in his story, the Spirit assured me that that is precisely the point. God isn't me or anyone like me. And that, truths, one of the faces of the gospel. As my life gains speed on the downward slope of the years, I'm beginning to get a better grasp on that truth. I still have a long way to go, Mark, you. But I'm... I think, making some headway. Look, if God is as great as I think he is, and he is infinitely more, would you tell me why he bothers with us at all? Any of us. Would I choose a relationship with a cockroach? I could see that I might if I were the Dumas man in the iron mask or Byron's prisoner of Shalon, imprisoned for a very long time and isolated. But would I do it under normal circumstances? Sometimes in my melancholy I think I must make God less or make man more if I'm to allow God to choose a relationship with us. But I can't make humanity more. Look at us, for pity's sake, the best of us. We're pretty pathetic, aren't we? It isn't that we're all violent monsters, rapists, and barbarians. No. We're not all the kind that stun us when we hear about things or catch a glimpse of them. I'm sure I'm supposed to say that that's the worst case scenario, but sometimes I wonder, for many of the rest of us seem to care so little, seem to be more than willing to settle for less. So we drift like leaves on the surface of a stream heading toward the gutter. It's true that Jesus came to convict us of our sins, but people as far apart as Harry Emerson Fosdick and Walter Brueggemann have taught us, Jesus came also to convict us of our possibilities. 
what I see in and around me is not only the possibility and or the practice of gross evil, but I see the general blasé approach to life as sort of who gives it damn unless it affects me or mine attitude. Can you even imagine the noise that there would be? The bedlam, the din? If every sick attitude, every brutal act, every crushing verbal insult, every abuse of power at a service counter or a government office, every racist slur, if they could all be heard, we'd be able to hear it at the edges of the expanding universe, for pity's sake. What if we could hear every groan of a little nation or smell every cellar the rapacious landlord calls a house and charges top rates for? Or since the terror of every child suffering in silence, we were burdened with all of that, would it not drive us to lunacy? This world, this life, is this as good as it gets? Is this what Christ has accomplished in 2,000 years? This? Hmm. That's why passages like Isaiah 32, 1 to 8 are so precious. They blow the whistle in all that corruption, abuse, indifference, and scorn. The passage is filled up only in the completed work of Jesus. We know that. That's why we sing such hymns as, A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and he covers me there with his hand. But the, pro the, the promise in the passage is more than that. We need to note this. A day is coming, the prophet tells us in 32.2, when people in the likeness of Jesus will appear. And of them, he says, each person, each man, each man and woman, each boy and girl, will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Humans. We're to be part of the healing of the world. The imagery is vivid and powerful. It's about people traveling through a desert, beaten to exhaustion by a howling wind that just won't let up. They find a cave in the rocks and take shelter from the storm that rages all around them. The imagery tells us of people right on the edge of death for lack of water. And look, astonishing, glorious sight. They stumble on a stream bubbling right up out of the sand, defying the desert conditions. The imagery is of people so hot, they're sure they can bear it no longer, sun-blasted, heat-afflicted. They're about to succumb to heat stroke, and they see a huge rock rising up out of the desert floor. Is it a mirage? Their strength's almost gone, but they make it to the shadow of this massive rock formation. And there, in the cooling shade, their life returns. It wasn't a mirage. It was real. Blessedly real. We're not to forget what the imagery points to. 
These are images that are used to describe men and women. The prophet said, In the days when a king would reign in righteousness, every person would be like something. And he gives us the images. At various times in history, George Adam Smith tells us, Men and women stood up and faced the scorching winds. People like Noah and Deborah, Abram, Ruth, Jeremiah, Moses' mother, and a host of unknowns. And by God's grace, they kept us alive. The drift of the moral desert choked them, of course, but where they bravely and gallantly stood, and though they finally fell, Jesus came and stood and still stands, and behind him a vast, People takes refuge, and they grow until that day when he comes to make this world all new in righteousness and joy. Until that day when everything is made right, when the howling winds of evil and apathy have beaten us so off track that we're almost despaired of finding a straight path, we catch the sight of a gorgeous woman, strong and assuring, and she becomes a refuge for the rest of us. When parched near to death, what a relief it is to meet someone whose life under God is water to the soul. It's more than relief. It's redemption. And in the burning heat of life, what an inexpressible pleasure it is to meet someone who uh, soft as a shadow without glare and fierceness and incessant demands, cools our fevered hearts and minds. To meet such people is to be blessed forever. To be such a person. Is that heaven? Maybe not. Maybe it's something better than heaven. Maybe it's to be Jesus to someone, Jesus to a whole church, to an entire community, the strugglers everywhere who can't stop thinking that if they dreamed of you and hoped for you, you must exist somewhere. The thought of people like you keeps people like me alive with hope. You save us from unbroken melancholy and certainly from a peevish and disbelieving cynicism created and sustained by ugly, sleek it people. You and your handfuls, you lovely people, strong and righteous, generous and soft, you're a promise that one day this world is going to be filled with people like you.